chapter 7 is specifically about the Catholic Church. And chapter 7 is telling us a lot about the, the history, uh, the historical development of, of the Catholic Church. And we, we already talked about a little bit of this with, you know, where did the different churches come from? In the West, they spoke Latin. And in the West, they also underwent some, some important historical movements or events that took a while, one of which was the collapse of Roman power. Um, the reason why the, the Catholic Church, and particularly the Roman Catholic portion of the, the Catholic Church, became so influential in, East, in Western history is because there was a power vacuum. And when people live together in, in some sort of you know, society, there's a lot of things that actually have to continue to happen. You know, if the secular power disappears, there's a barbarian invasion, uh, economic collapse in a lot of places, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of other issues coming up. What are the sort of things that have to happen? There's that, that old saying, you know, somebody has to make sure that the trains run on time. Obviously, they didn't have trains. But what are the really basic elements of social life that have to continue? Let's say the town of Poughkeepsie, like, disappeared as, as an entity. All the buildings are still there. And we turn on the TV or the radio or our phones, and we find out the federal government's gone. The state of New York government is also gone. County government's gone. What the hell are we going to do? We start looting everything, you know, ah, it's going to be a holiday. Forget class. That might be fun for a little bit, but then, you know, that's not really a great way to live, is it? What, what do we need soon after that? Yeah? Eventually someone has to monopolize the violence. Yeah, and, and the church didn't really do that. It left it up to you know local rulers who are supposed to you know regulate things. You know, oftentimes kings and, and barons and knights and people like that. Um, they'd come down on them if they were doing doing the wrong stuff, which often they were. Um, sometimes bishops actually ended up holding secular power like that. It led to all sorts of problems. But what else? So don't let anyone kill anybody or rob anybody. What are other functions of society that has to have to continue? If you're gonna have a society. Yeah. It has to have like some kind of structure to it and like people will follow like a set of rules. Yeah, okay, so you have to provide something not just a bunch of laws, but actually some some sort of mores, some sort of here's how we do things here that people can count on. The church actually had its own courts after a while. Um, so why do you have courts? To decide issues between people, right? Um, the church in many places supplied education. You know, you would send your kids to the local monastery where they were educated, and they would, um, they would send your kids back and they might actually be able to read, you know, or do mathematics, or, you know, those sorts of things that we take for granted. Um, the church filled in many other aspects of, of life. And that's important to keep in mind with respect to the development of the Western church. As other things came in, as the, the state became more powerful, as the towns became more powerful, as economic changes occurred, um, there was often a lot of struggle between um, these, different, these different factors. And there were always some people saying, thank God, we don't have to worry about that anymore in the church, and other people saying, no, it's best if we hold on to that. So there's always this tension going on. Um, your book also talks about something else that's important uh, with respect to, to Catholicism, also with respect to, to Orthodoxy. Um, where do you, in fact, get your norms from for what it means to be a, a Christian and how you know society ought to be organized, how one ought to live? Um, Christianity is what we call a revealed religion. Meaning that, like in many other religions, they believe that the divine somehow revealed a, a plan, a norm, 
the way that human beings ought to act, think, behave. And some of this, for Catholics, is in terms of sacred documents. The Bible, right? Scripture. Scripture means written texts. Um, all the other early churches, along with the Catholic Church, also accepted as equal to Scripture tradition, and you can say tradition with a capital T. And this means this sort of ongoing process by which the church, as a, a body, figures out the things that it needs to figure out. Not everything is going to be found in the Bible. Um, you know, so think about those church councils, for example. That would be part of tradition. Um, some people would put the writings of the church fathers in there as normative. And then for the Roman Catholic Church and all the other Eastern churches that are, you know, these other rites within it, you have something that's a bit different called magisterium. Magisterium means teaching authority. Um, the magisterium would be the Pope, the bishops, the bishops all together as a council, definitively deciding things. And, you know, so when, when for example, um, Pope Francis comes in, why, why is that important? Is he going to, you know, is he just a nice guy and he'll say mass nicely and, uh, you know, shake people's hands and stuff like that? He's actually supposed to be a decider. He's supposed to set the agenda. So when he writes things, like these papal encyclicals, um, they're supposed to actually, you know, set the tone. They're supposed to be, in some respects, equal in dignity and in, you know, showing what, what God wants to these other things. Um, and it, it's, uh, it's a distinctively Catholic thing to see this as equal to the <coughs> oftentimes the Orthodox kind of roll uh, magisterium into tradition. For Protestants, for the most part, there will be a few exceptions, it's just this, just Scripture, sola scriptura, Scripture alone. This is one of the, the hallmarks of the, of the Protestant Reformation. So this is something very important to know about the, the structure of these, these older churches and about the Catholic Church. Um, your book talks about, you know, if you want to look at Roman Catholic Church, each of those words has an a important meaning. Um, you know, Rome, the Bishop of Rome, Catholic meaning universal. It really is understood as um, a church that's supposed to be like going to the, the ends of the world and incorporating everybody. Um, and then, you know, church, the ecclesial community, the, the um, bringing everything together, having a sort of, you know, vision of life as a totality. So, you know, just to use an example, um, Pope Francis, if you guys have been following the news, um, he ticked off, and if you're Pope, you're always going to tick off somebody. If you're holding any position of authority in a religious group, you will tick off somebody invariably. Uh, but Pope Francis ticked off a lot of um, conservative Catholics recently. What did he do? What did he, what did he say? What kinds of things? Yeah, he's like very open to the gay community, so a lot of people are against that. Yeah, he said, you know, being Catholic is not about being anti-gay. Um, I don't, I don't have that in mind. Although that would, that would, that was something that you know people are like. He said that about about um, uh, gay rights, and he said that about abortion. But these are not the one single deciding factors. I'm thinking more in economic terms. People are saying, it's a socialist pope. Um, I have a lot of very conservative Catholic friends because you know, I'm, I'm on Facebook and I, I, went, I went to Catholic high school and grew up uh, as, as a Catholic, although I you know, was not particularly devout. And a lot of my friends, you know, you get into your 30s, 40s, a lot of them kind of get kind of conservative. 
And when he came out and said, you know, capitalism really needs to have some limits on it. Which he did in, in some papal addresses. People were like, I can't believe it. He's a communist. He's a socialist. Actually, you know, what he was saying is, is the same thing that other popes before him have said, including John Paul and Leo XIII, you know, and has been a long time part of, of tradition. And he drew on scripture to do that. Um, these are all sort of good examples. Why is the Pope saying anything about economics? Shouldn't he just like stick to religious stuff and mind his own business when it comes to the marketplace? Well, this goes to what your book is talking about. As church, as opposed to sort of sect, this narrow, uh, it's, it's us over here and the rest of you stay away. We can separate ourselves out from the world. Churches, in this classic sense, are understood as, as being tied in with all the other aspects of life. Um, so that's going to bring about certain, certain tensions. Um, it, it has some discussions here about the different sacraments, but we've already talked about those a bit. So I, you know, the book has a good discussion of that and how they fit in with the sort of cycle of you know, going from birth all the way to, to death. Um, but I'm going to skip over that uh, to talk about a few other things. Another thing that's considered to be distinctively Catholic, it really isn't. It's really all pre-Reformation churches, is the veneration of Mary and the saints. And you might say, why, why set Mary aside? Isn't she just one of the saints? Well, she's understood as being the mother of God, the Theotokos, as we talked about. Remember the council of, of, um, of uh, Nicaea? It can, concerns that a bit, right? Or no, I'm sorry, Ephesus. Um, concerns that? So, veneration of, of Mary and the saints, you know, this notion of, of praying to saints as intercessors to get them to help out with certain things. Um, those of you who come from a Catholic background, if I were to say the saints of hopeless causes, would that be, is that still a thing these days? It was for my generation. Um, anyone know? St. Jude? You know, so somebody will be like, well, you know, if it's, if it's hopeless, pray to this saint. And there, there tends to be always sort of a thin line between a kind of superstitious attitude towards this and a, an understanding of, of what these, these saints are about. Well, how do people get to be saints? Just by answering prayers and having tons of power. In theory, you know, there, there, there are some saints who like had to be desainted, you know, over time when they realized that there weren't any historical people corresponding to them, which really made a lot of people mad. Um, but in general, how does it work? Those are the exceptions. What are saints? They're holy, right? What makes them holy? Just like saying, hey, I'm holy, and then everyone says, oh, we'll take your say so on that. You actually have, you know, what they did. Um, yeah, you know, very often these are very tough things to do. You know, um, think about martyrs, for example, one subcategory of saints. Martyrs generally got, the, you know, really beat up badly or killed for saying, I, I believe. Usually by people who said, if you don't stop saying that stuff, we're going to kill you. Um, and then they said, well, you got to say it anyway. Um, that takes a lot of guts. Um, other saints cared for, for people. Demonstrated they're actually models in a certain way. Of, for example, love. Or faith. Devotion. Caring for, for other human beings, even if they're people you don't like, you know. Um, now, why why did the saints become very important in in all the early churches? 
There's a lot of theories about this. One is that it allowed, you know, if God is this kind of shadowy, distant figure, it's easier to, to see um, a connection to somebody who's a little bit more like you. Because every saint started out as some, some schmuck, generally, who wasn't a saint, and then there was some sort of process of, of becoming better. Uh, it's easier to relate to than somebody who's like good right off the bat, isn't it? And it would be for me. Um, and, and that's one theory. There's a lot of other different theories out there about that, but we're going we're gonna to skip over that a bit. Um, your book also talks about monasticism again, which we're going to skip over. Uh, it talks about purgatory. Purgatory is, is something that, again, is also distinctive to, to Catholic theology. Um, what is, I suppose I should spend a few, a few brief moments on this. And again, we're going to oversimplify here. Um, how does the notion of purgatory work? Uh, is it like this? So if you're if you're good, where do you go? <laughs> go up. Uh, if you're bad, you go to the, the terrible place. And if you're kind of good and kind of bad, but didn't really have your act together, then you go to purgatory. Is that is that the way the, the idea works basically? Or is there more to the story than that? I'm guessing there's more. Well, you're right. <laughs> what is the more? Are these just like three kind of holding places? The, the early Christians, you know, just heaven and hell, and then, you know, Catholics realize that a lot of people are kind of in between, so you need, you know, a new layer. What, what are you going to say? I see, like, purgatory is more as like a waiting place where you wait to see where you're going to go. Oh! So it'd be like it'd be like this. Maybe you go from purgatory to hell, or maybe you go to heaven. Usually it happens, but but maybe you could really screw up in purgatory. You know, like if you don't if you, they they let you in on the what's the name of that? They're going to let you in provisionally, provided you don't screw it up, and and you actually do screw it up. So they say, well, I guess hell is the place for, for you. No, it doesn't work like that. That would make a great movie. Though. That would make a great play. The idea is that um, purgatory means a place of, of uh, purification. And there, there's various theologies about this, one of them being that you, St. Anselm, for example, thought that you wouldn't want to actually be in the presence of God in heaven without being purified of everything that's you know, screwed up about you. And that, you know, explained to you that way, purgatory would actually be kind of a good place to be. Because um, first off, it's not hell, right? Um, is this something that's completely or distinctively Catholic? Some of the early churches actually thought that we should pray for those in hell because we may thereby save them. Um, there's always a controversial belief. That sounds an awful lot like this, this doctrine. Um, and I merely point this out to you as uh, sort of a Catholic distinctive. Something else that your book talks about, now we've talked about these Catholic distinctives. Something else that your book talks about is what we might call a process of hardening and relaxing. Um, in history, the Protestant Reformation takes place as a reformation of the Catholic Church originally. Martin Luther we're going to talk about this next class period, started out as a Catholic, didn't mean to quit being a Catholic. The church had gone through a number of reforms at different points. Luther was calling some, for some progressively more and more radical things. At the time that he actually nailed up the 96 Theses, 95 or 96, I always get that mixed up, he actually said, uh, I don't have a problem with the doctrine of purgatory. Later on, he sort of you know, hardens his position about that. As the Reformation takes place, uh, and we're going to see this next class period, all sorts of, you know, once you open the doors, all sorts of new ideas and doctrines, many of them sort of try to trace themselves back to early Christianity, come onto the scene, and they have a lot of energy and a lot of force behind them. 
Um, and the Reformation is <coughs> Protestant. What happens to the Catholics at that time? Do they just say, well, you don't want to be one of them. Hang out over here with us. There's actually a kind of hardening of, of Catholic doctrine that takes place, something that we call a counter-reformation. Nowadays, it's more fashionable to call it the Catholic Reformation, because in large part, it did consist in trying to strip away things that were um, seen as, as uh, mistakes. And one of the key events to associate with this is what they call the Council of Trent. And then they'll call this post Tridentine. Catholicism, Trent, Trent becomes tr Trident, you know, Tridentine. And so, you know, from about this, the, you know, the, the beginning, well, the, the middle of the Reformation all the way to the 20th century, you have this, this kind of consolidation of, of Catholic doctrine, of ways of doing things. Um, things got kind of fixed in place. What changed that? There were a lot of social forces that changed that. And we're not going to have time to go into all the, the ins and outs of this, but that would be the role of what we call Vatican II, the Second Vatican Council. And what is that happening in the 1960s? So actually from 62 to 64, if I remember right, very recently. And it had to do with, you know, here's just one example of it, and then we'll, we'll end. Um, turning the, the priest from facing away from the congregation to facing towards the congregation and no longer doing the Mass in Latin, which very few people could understand, but actually doing it in the vernacular of the country. Uh, in this case, usually English. Um, so we're going to touch on this in later chapters, but this gives you kind of a thumbnail sketch of where we're going. And hopefully now, if you didn't know some things about Orthodox and Catholics, you actually have some idea of who these people are.